just before I get started, because it felt great to stand up, I want to I wanna do a bit of a public experiment. For those who are online, uh, you're welcome to follow along. But I'm going to ask you just the simple question of how your brain is today. And I, f what I want to do is I want you to first answer that question in terms of how you feel. So uh, immediately you'll probably think, OK, how do I feel my brain is today? So if, if you feel like on a scale of 1 to 10, it's somewhere between 5 and 10, um, stand up just to get it, some exercise and stand up and, and sort of show me, instead of raising hands, that you feel your brain is somewhere between 5 and 10. Sorry? 10 is good. Good question, yes. Upper. So if, if, you're, if you feel your brain is good, it's subjectively, right? This is a subjective experiment so far. You're feeling it's pretty good. You know, maybe you're jet lagged. You came in from somewhere else, so you're below five. That would be too bad for you. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Now, objectively, in terms of your brain, in terms of if you had to do something from a healthcare medical perspective, take a pill, get a surgery, or otherwise, um, if you feel you know where your brain is, let's say you're worried about cognitive uh, processing as you age, if you feel you know exactly where your brain is, stay standing. A uh, few people stand, stood up again. <laughs> so I'll just re-clarify it, because I hope some people stand. If you think you know exactly where your brain is right now, in other words, let's use cognitive impairment. Let's say that you, you know you don't need any treatment for cognitive impairment whatsoever, a pill or any cognitive rehab, stay standing. Okay, how do you know that? That's my question. Do you have an objective measure that tells you exactly where your brain function is today? For those who have an objective measure, they're routinely monitoring at home with a sensor and they know exactly how their cognitive function is today, stay standing. Okay, perfect. Okay, so carry that thought experiment with you through my talk, if you will, please. Now, as, as mentioned by Shell, um, I, I both have uh, roles at the university as a neuroimager, which is why I asked the MEG question, and uh, as a professor, but I, I've also, uh, I've got a bit of a, a pathology, I, I suppose, in terms of we were doing human neurotechnology and we were helping dramatically in, neuro, in uh, not only neurology and devastating neurology diseases, neurosurgery and psychiatry, but we were helping um, in an advanced lab only. And so one of the other interesting aspects, which I'm also sort of disclosing, is my talk today will come more from my role um, from creating a startup company here in Vancouver uh, that's been around for about 10 years and employs uh, now, I think, around uh, 65 or, or more people um, and is focused on taking what I do in the university and actually translating it and implementing it into something in the real world. So as I, I give you this, this talk, I want you to just take that in mind that the perspective I'm coming from was a frustration that it wasn't okay for me to continue publishing papers that my peers might, may or may not read, may or may not like, but I knew for sure it wouldn't get out in the world and help people. And the particular area I wanted to focus on was the fact that there's a lot of subjectivity in how we currently evaluate our brain health. Oh, let's go that way. So, I'm from Vancouver. This is just a quick slide to give you an image of where we're from. In Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, there's an area called Surrey. And as part of my role, actually, I've built uh, large um, health technology clusters. This is uh, the Health and Technology District. It's a billion dollar cluster. It's coming up on about 10 years. Uh, both UBC, SFU, and other universities are there. And it's behind, beside the, the main busiest hospital um, in our region, and in fact, holds records in North America for most emergency visits in uh, a year. So this area right here, 
focuses on an overarching hypothesis, which is a, uh, very germane to this conference, which is our healthcare problems can be rapidly and quickly um, impacted by technology innovation first and foremost. And we started with the stand exercise because I wanted to emphasize the main problem that I've been working at for now, coming between 25, coming up on 30 years. And that's that um, you can see here that in my laboratory setting, I, I've run, I've spent an entire career running the most advanced non-invasive brain imaging labs on the planet. This takes together all sorts of you know, multi-million dollar tools like MEG, and you see in the background MRI, and it deploys in hospitals and applies and develops translational ways to help devastating brain conditions. And what I noticed, and I was at a long-standing frustration, was that there's a massive gap. In these labs, in labs like this, we do head-spinningly advanced technological imaging. We can look non-invasively into your brain and peer in incredibly powerful ways. Yet it's completely inaccessible. There's a massive gap between if today, let's say you slipped and you fell and you were worried about a concussion and you go to get health care, the equivalent of what you're getting today, and this is not controversial, hasn't changed since the 1980s. That was a problem that I felt very passionately we needed to focus to find a solution. To me, it was not okay to just send all this stuff out as research publications, but out rather come up with a model that would connect our high-powered imaging labs to the things that we can get every day for ourselves, our loved ones, our families, and otherwise. So on the, on the other side of the screen is actually what our implemented solution for it is in a conceptual model. So today I'm going to tell you about our, our deployable, portable cognitive brain scanner called NeuroCatch where we've taken it into a vital sign framework. So think about blood pressure cuffs and think about 120 over 80 and think about how you use that to manage your heart health and how that creates risk factors. And we thought, why do we not have that for your brain? And what we did is we actually developed that technology and I'll show you that. And that actually, because we had basically the world's first objective ruler for how your brain is doing, allowed us to start having all the amazing innovative treatments that are coming down the pipe come to us. So we have line of sight probably to the best innovations on the planet at any given time. And we do clinical trials and we find out if they work. And when they work, we then roll them into our own advanced neural rehab clinic where we apply them. And we have people flying from around the world as far quite literally as away as Australia, Europe, America, you name it, to come to get access to these advanced treatments because they've seen them out there in the scientific literature, but they don't know how to get access to them. And that, in our way, is our way to scale that up so that we don't just help the 15,000 we've helped so far, but we actually go into the billions and make sure this is accessible to all of the planet. So let's talk more about what we started with, this measurement gap. So you saw that picture at the bottom, which was paper and pencil testing. So what hasn't really changed, it's got digitized. We use laptops or, or iPads or what have you now. But most assessment of your cognitive function relies on neuropsychological assessment. And if you see this target here, that's the one on the left side. So if you're thinking about wanting to really have accuracy and precision, these are challenging. They're challenging in the healthcare field. They're costly in both expense and time, and they're not really effective in terms of how we manage our outcomes. So what we've done now, the field has shifted and it has started to move towards objective neurophysiological measures, where we put a sensor on your scalp, and we use something like electroencephalography or magnetoencephalography to measure your physiological responses, objectively and sensitively and non-invasively. And actually, what we've been able to do, because these give you a certain degree of accuracy, so they tighten up things a little bit more, but they have two problems. One is they don't have the precision, and, and precision in this case means sensitivity. So if you do have something subtle that's happening in your brain, you don't want an insensitive instrument. You want something that detects it early so we can intervene early. So we've been able to advance this technology to be more and more precise, and importantly, more and more accessible, which is the real engineering challenge 
um, because we have to move those advanced labs and turn them into something as simple as a blood pressure cuff. Does that all make sense so far? All right. So then, this is the point where as a scientist in a lab, it got scary, right? So when you're trying towards this goal, I personally was trained as a neuroscientist. You know, there's between 80 and 100 billion neurons. Each of them have tens of thousands of synaptic connections. And when you consider the fact that they actually can modify themselves, the number of functional connections is actually towards infinity. So we deal in complexity, right? But yet, when you look at what the healthcare system needs, it needs simplicity. And it's actually bottled simplicity in the concepts of vital signs. So we know about vital signs, they're ubiquitous. We all know about blood pressure and pulse ox and that's, that sort of thing. But would it stun you to know that up until 10 years ago, no one that I knew of had ever asked the question, why don't we have a vital sign for our brain? It's a massive gap. And it's also a scary question. Because of all this complex data that we get from an even more complex brain, how are you going to do that? So we set to work on reverse engineering that actually from using existing vital signs and coming up with a method that used an accessible technology, EEG, which is increasingly more affordable, miniaturized, portable, and, and useful, non-invasive sensors on your, on your scalp so you can do it in dry electrodes or wet electrodes or what have you. And then we set about taking down the barriers of what we do in the lab with EEG versus what would be the equivalent of having something like a blood pressure cuff. And we created a vital science scientific framework and then the NeuroCatch technology platform to be deployable, to unleash the concept in medicine, age-old axiom, you can't treat what you can't measure. So you've got to start with the measurement first in order to open up the treatment options and find out which treatment options are great. Think back again to blood pressure. If you want to know if medications that manage um, hypertension work, you need to have a very fast and easy and objective measure of blood pressure. And then you can find out what medications work. What do you think is happening in dementia right now? That's why dementia, in one of the major reasons, is stumbling in terms of coming up with ways to treat it. So, NeuroCatch actually uses a derivative of EEG called event-related potentials. These are small cognitive responses that we extract using signal averaging. We stimulate your brain with um, basically sounds, just like you're hearing now, both uh, just beeps and also words, so we can get cognitive responses. And we can do all of that um, in a Health Canada-approved device. So this is actually in its second generation, what I'm showing you now. We've had lots of approvals, so it's been out, um, which is an entire different um, obstacle to moving something out of the lab. We, and we can take what would take me three hours in the laboratory, and we took it down to six minutes. And we can make it accessible and blank. Oh, there it is. Um, and most importantly, automate it. So this is automated so that you don't require an expert to do it. You push a button, it runs, you get the result. Why is that important? Number one, it's easy. But number two, medically, it allows for a standardized data set. So we can now say, OK, this, this test is not dependent on me running it. If you ran it, it'd be the same test, and we can compare your results with everyone else's. So that was the engineering technology challenge that we tackled. And this is what it actually looks like today, right? So this is a second generation NeuroCatch. You can see in the top corner, it is portable. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's sitting in a small box right now. Uh, the size of the box is actually dictated by the fact that we use a laptop. You can also see that it's non-invasive. So it's a, a pretty standard cap for EEG with a couple of sensors on the head. You put some gel in, put some ear, ear inserts in, hit go, and the test is done six minutes later. And it produces an intuitive result. So we'll dig into some science in this. But just to start, I want you to take a look at, because you could ask me, and you'd be right, what is a brain vital sign? And a brain vital sign, it turns out, wasn't a number, like 120 over 80. It was actually a shape, a hexagon, that you see in the center of this image. And that was because we were measuring three responses and the amplitude and latency of both. So three times two is six. So when we put that into a normative radar plot framework, normal human cognition looks like a symmetric hexagon. That's the hexagon you want. 
So I could have re-asked that question, if you have a symmetric hexagon, stay standing, so which is why I'm still standing. I have a symmetric hexagon, in case you were wondering. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is the little piece in the middle there, uh, you see in the center, which is just a device we built to ensure, and for the techie people out there, um, we trigger and we mark our EEG record. The computer processor jitters that. It causes blur. This device takes away that blur and marks it down to the millisecond resolution, which means we have the most sensitive, i.e., back when I showed you that target, most precise detection of these brain responses on the planet. That's going to be important in a minute. You might say, okay, that's your university pro professor hat telling you, wow, we did something cool techie, but that's actually going to translate into what's important in a minute. So let me give you an example of what this is. This is work we've done. We've been working with the Mayo um, to advance concussion care for over a decade now um, with early surrogates of this. And what you're seeing here is a study with Junior A Hockey um, that we published in Brain in 2019. It was one of the sort of landmark studies where for the first time in the sort of in what we know of the history, somebody had objectively measured um, immediately after concussion in the dressing room to find out what was going on with neurophysiological responses. And when we map these into this hexagon framework, you can see that baseline is a hexagon. When we get them in acute concussion, the shape changed dramatically because these responses, the, um, basically every single one of these responses required more cortex to fire in the acute condition, and it took longer. And so it systematically shifted this standardized shape into a triangular pattern. And then when we go to return to play, you can see that that pro uh, profile actually looks like it did at the baseline point. Now let's dig deeper into this, because it gets pretty cool. So the reality is this is actually the figures taken from the paper rather than the fancy animation. And here you can see that in the triangular, all those asterisks are statistically very significant or significant differences. So those shifts were real. When you see at the right, you see more symbols. The crosses mean it shifted significantly back, so crosses are good. However, with this response called a P300 response, which is basic attention and the amplitude of that response, it had not returned back. So these were the best of the best concussion protocols on the planet by the Mayo Clinic, and they were still returning athletes early than they should have. And if you think, okay, well, that sounds dramatic, Ryan, then look at the bottom. Subconcussion is not a term you necessarily might have heard. Subconcussion is all the players that did not get a diagnosed concussion in the season. So when we look at their differences before the season and after the season, we saw a significant impact-related differences, exposures to impact. We now know in the world this is very serious because of things like CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what you hear in the news all the time in terms of dementias and suicides and mental health. And we know that this is actually more scary because there's no diagnosis, there's no detection, which means there's no treatment, which means it accumulates over time and your brain accelerates into a bad state. We now have the sensitivity to detect this in an objective measure. And not only do we have the sensitivity, but we can actually predict your exposure to impact. So when we have data of sensors on your helmet, and we know how much you've actually been impacted, we can measure this difference and tell. And just so, it drive the point home, in 17 to 21 year olds, that's the sample, that difference is roughly a 200 millisecond delay in your cognitive processing, which is a very big delay because your cognitive processing of the words I'm saying starts around 200 milliseconds after you hear them. So how about some more um, uh, applications that demonstrate the need to have an objective vital sign measure? This is a, a soldier that I've been working with, Captain Trevor Green, who was in Afghanistan in 2006, so that's 16 years ago, was responsible for leading conversations with the village where they would sit down, take their helmets off, lay their, lay their firearms down, and say, we're Canada, how can we help? A young 16-year-old um, under the sway of the Taliban came up, drove an ax into the top of Trevor's head, created a, one of the largest brain injuries on the planet. Trevor survived. Trevor's pushed back, and Trevor has 
focused on rehabilitating his physical, his movement capabilities, but he also has cognitive and PTSD-related, understandably, uh, impairments. What you're looking at here is when we found one of the most advanced technologies on the planet before anyone had access, we applied it to Trevor, and we could show systematically that we could recover him back to a healthy hexagon shape, healthy cognitive function. And what was really heartwarming about this is concurrently, he and his wife um, noted some, uh, some highly significant drops in his PTSD. His night terrors went away. So how about you? How about healthy aging? Well, this is the hexagon on the top right hand. You can see right away that when we compare adults that are in their earlier uh, years versus adults that are in their later years, we know already this confirms that our cognitive health changes as we age and not for the good necessarily. So what's interesting with this is you get to actually see the underlying data that forms these hexagons. I'll orient you. These are your uh, cognitive evoked potentials. The horizontal axis is time in one millisecond, or sorry, one in one second. And the vertical axis is the size of your response. Negative in this case, a negative peak is up. And so your response to a sound is about 100 milliseconds negative. Your response to a, a sort of unexpected sound is about 300 milliseconds after you hear it going positive. And your response to the words I'm saying are about 400 milliseconds after you hear it. And what we can detect here is that the current tests your physician or clinical health provider give you in the lower corner there would detect that there's nothing wrong with you. There's no difference between you and somebody who is younger than you. And this test is sensitive enough to show you otherwise. And then my final example, because I always like to leave things on positive notes, because you might say, oh, well, that's scary. There's subconcussion, and that's scary. You know, things are going a lot worse in my brain if I actually measured it, if I knew. It's not so scary. This is us enhancing your cognition through neuromodulation technology. So this is us basically taking somebody and using neuromodulation to rewire your brain and accelerate um, and improve your attention and your vigilance. So if I bored you today, you can use this technology and next time you'll pay more attention. So where are we going? Well, we're 2022 now, so this is launched. Next, we're gonna improve the form factor so you'll see it in more and more cool looking devices and then it'll get integrated. And all of this is going to access the sort of the critical thing. Back to your brain is not static. Our treatments assume static. We give you medications, we do surgery. We now know that your brain has this inherent concept that we can unleash called neuroplasticity, which is your ability to rewire new circuits. So in terms of the future of technologies, by being able to measure it objectively, we're opening up all sorts of avenues, not only to repair your brain in disease or injury, but also to improve it and augment it over time. And that's it. Ryan Darcy!